Well, let me uh, slightly recap and also um, add a few things that we ran out of time to say at the end of the last lecture. <coughs> We had different discussions in dimension 8, 7, and 6. Uh, up in 8 dimensions, the, um, the, the, the result we stated at the end of the lecture was that if we have our 8-manifold and a 4-form, which satisfies the algebraic condition of being a special type of sort of admissible forms at each point, Uh, then, uh, and if, if in addition it's a closed four form, then um, we get a, a, a torsion free spin Stebbin structure on the manifold, in particular a metric of holonomy contained in spin 7. So, part of that story, which I didn't quite have time to explain the algebra of, is that from this four form, one can concoct a Riemannian metric. So this gives a, a Riemannian metric G psi, con constructed entirely algebraically from this form. And then this the statement is that this metric will have holonomy contained in spin 7. Contained in SO8. <coughs> <coughs> but then we can reduce this discussion uh, successively in dimension, just reversing the process by which we built up our study of these forms from dimension 6. So if we consider an 8-manifold that's a product with a 7-manifold with a real line or with a circle, then we can obtain corresponding results uh, <coughs> in 7 dimensions. If we have a 7-manifold, then if we have a positive 3-form, Then, um, purely algebraically, from this, we, as we said, we can construct a Riemannian metric, g phi, and also the Hodge star, which is right, star phi of phi. Uh, <coughs> and if these satisfy that phi is closed and the star phi is closed, then um, we get a metric of holonomy contained in g2, contained in SO7. <laughs> this is a purely algebraic story. And if I was. This is a purely algebraic story you are telling. So if I were not going to definite but uh, generic, would you get some uh, the pseudo Riemannian metric in the same way? Um, there is another case where you get a pseudo Riemannian metric, yes, but our, our hypothesis. Well, considering these things that give genuine Riemannian metrics, that was the yeah. But otherwise, it would be pseudo Riemannian. Well, there's another yes. There's another case. That's right. So there's a look. I have two open sets in the space of three forms, and one gives Riemannian, and one would give a signature th four three. <coughs> so, or, or we can come down to dimension six, uh, where we have a, a, th a three form. Rho, which would be what we called definite. This also gives us a, a corresponding, another three form we call rho tilde. Uh, this by itself wouldn't give us a metric, but so let's consider a, we said this gives a complex structure, an almost complex structure, so we can consider a two form which defines a. Um, <coughs> which is positive with respect to the complex structure, let's write this way. And uh, if, so that we get a metric G of, of rho and omega, and if D rho is zero, and D rho tilde is zero, and D omega is zero, then we get a metric of the holonomy contained in SU3 in SO6. <coughs> So this is a, a sort of a non-standard way of describing Calabi Yau threefolds metrics on <coughs> this will be a 
three-dimensional complex manifold with a, a Kähler metric of zero Ricci curvature, but we can describe them in terms of uh, exterior forms, rho and omega satisfying these conditions. <coughs> So all the metrics uh, that we achieve have got the, the, the property of having zero Ricci curvature, the metrics. We get have Ricci equals zero. So that essentially the only way, um, the only examples of metrics on compact manifolds which um, I've got zero Ricci curvature, but in an interesting way, are they not, for example, flat or something like that, um, are given by these three, either by calabi manifolds or these two exceptional cases. So let's now go on to a, um, a very short and compressed section. I was going to say more, but if we keep up to time, we'll compress this, uh, to say something about what are the geometry that one can do inside one of these manifolds. Supposing we're given one of these manifolds, what are the specially interesting differential geometric things that we could study? <coughs> inside such a manifold, or with these manifolds. <coughs> right, some, they say some. There's the lo there are lots of things we could do, but we'll talk about some of the most notable things. What is most notable is that uh, we can first discuss some manifold geometry, and then there are uh, various classes of what are called calibrated Submanifolds in this situation. I won't really take the time to recall that, but if we if we just go back to our model of remember of R seven is R four times R three. So remember we wrote down a model three form in terms of a of a splitting like this. So if you have such a splitting, then this subspace is called co-associative, and this subspace is called associative. So any, any what was the way of saying it, any four-dimensional subspace which is equivalent under the action of G2 to this one is called associative, and, sorry, co-associative, and similarly for the associatives. Of course, they have, they, they have intrinsic descriptions as well, but let's not give that. <coughs> So on a, looking at the seven-dimensional case, on a seven-dimensional manifold, we can look at sub-manifolds, which are associative sub-manifolds, where at each point the tangent space is one of these particular subspaces, or similarly, co-associative sub-manifolds. <coughs> so we take dimension seven. We have associative three-dimensional submanifolds or co-associative four-dimensional submanifolds. Uh, so, in fact, we can think of these four-dimensional, or we can think of both of these being derived from a special kind of submanifold in eight dimensions, it's not defined that, called the Cayley submanifold, four dimensions, in the sense that if you think of your um, Eight manifold is the product of a seven manifold times R, then the, the Cayley submanifolds that happen to lie on the side of the seven manifold, or the, the co associative ones, the Cayley submanifolds that are a product of a three dimensional manifold with R, the three dimensional manifold is the associative one. So these, no, these are sort of match up in a natural way with respect to taking products. <coughs> and then we can come down to dimension six where things are more familiar, we get um, holomorphic curves, two-dimensional, and special Lagrangian submanifolds, three-dimensional, which 
fit into the pattern in the same way. If we take the product of a holomorphic curve with R, then we get an associative submanifold of, the, of, our, of our cylinder, and so forth. So all of these things have got the property of being calibrated submanifolds, which is, um, I, won't, I won't recall the, the definition. But in particular, they're, they're minimal submanifolds, and the, so they, they minimize area. But they, in the compact situation, they absolutely mi minimize area in their homology class. <coughs> Then, um, being even more brief, there's another particular kind of geometry that one can look at in the situation, which is what's called Yang-Mills geometry. That's to say, uh, we consider a bundle over our manifold. <coughs> Let's call it, say, pi over our manifold M with some structure group, some other group, let's call it gamma, and a connection A on this bundle. Then again, there are particular things we can do in these situations, in this setup, for the following reason. Remember, when we were thinking about our holonomy groups, we said that the Lie algebra of the holonomy group would be a, sub a subspace of the space of two forms, the exterior square. So if we have one of these manifolds, for G being the corresponding holonomy group, we get a special space of two forms in omega 2. I just defined by the point ways condition that they lie inside this preferred subspace. So we can consider connections with the property that the curvature of the connection lies inside is a two form of this special kind with values in the the adjoint bundle of r and pi. So this is a, a generalized, what you might call instant on equation. It's the same character as the, the four-dimensional instant on equation in the, uh, the Yang-Mills equation. <coughs> and these are interesting equa equations to study in all of these three cases. But let's not say anything more about that now. Maybe, maybe there'll be time to say a few more words about these kind of interesting geometric structures, both the calibrated geometry and the Yang-Mills geometry, uh, in the next lecture. But maybe not. So we'll see. Maybe this is the last you'll see of all that. <laughs> So the main, the main point, from now on we're really going to talk about G2, um, well, actually the seven-dimensional case. Uh, and the main point of this lecture is to say something about the global theory of these structures on a compact seven-manifold. Well, here I mean, what I mean, I mean global in the sense of global on a compact manifold, but I mean really local with respect to looking at, as you'll see, small deformations. So local in the space of structures, but global over a compact manifold. So global theory on a compact seven manifold. So we want to, we just in this case, we want to understand more these equations for a, well, it's, everything is determined by a single three form, but we have these two different equations for, for the three form and for the, the corresponding four form. And there's a, there's a, there's a useful, good way of understanding that uh, in, term, in terms of point of view introduced by Hitchin. Uh, a very natural variational point of view. <coughs> so we're going to have a fixed, compact, oriented seven manifold. Uh, we fix a class, what should we call it? Say C in H3 of um, M, R. <coughs> and we fix, um, fix uh, we look at 
three forms phi, well, they're going to be closed three forms uh, representing this cohomology class. So let, um, let's, let's say, let's, what do we call it? Say, not quite sure what to call it. Let's call it, say, AC to be the set of positive phi with closed with phi is equal to C. So we're looking at, just looking at, we're looking at, the, the algebraic condition of having a positive three form, we're keeping the condition of being closed, but we're dropping this complicated nonlinear equation. So <coughs> these things are, well, we should hope, easier to understand. This is somewhat analogous to studying a symplectic structure, we're imposing an, an open condition on our forms, just a, a sort of non-degeneracy condition. Uh, and we're looking at a closed form, but that's all we're, we're doing. We're not, there's no differential equation really involved. So studying these, these things is somewhat, somewhat like symplectic geometry with the difference that there's no Darboo theorem. These things have local structure. They're not locally trivial. Anyway, let, let's consider this thing. Of course, this could be empty. We don't, but let's suppose it's not. Let's suppose that we, we can, at least in our given cohomology class, find some representative by positive forms. <coughs> then we have a natural volume function on phi. Volume of m phi of ac. Oh. Just given by just the fact that algebraically, uh, well, what we've said is that our, our three form defines a metric, but that in turn has a volume form. So. So, so a simpler thing is to say, from this three form, we have a, an algebraic way of concocting a volume form. Let's call it nu phi. <coughs> so phi goes to, let's write, small vol phi in uh, omega 7. And so the volume, volume of the manifold is just the integral of this vol phi over m. And the, the observation is that this equation is just the Euler-Lagrange equation for the volume function in this setting on this space. So um, and we can think of our problem, if you like, of trying to find these structures as first understand whether we have this, this sort of coarser, solving this coarser problem, of, and then can we f find critical points of this volume function. So this is quite easy to see. If we just go back to the, the sort of the fine dimensional um, algebra of this set setup, we have we made just of the map that takes a positive three form to this volume form. Uh, so this is, of course, just a point. So um, we can we can differentiate that. And what is the so if we take, if we have a if we have a an interval variation delta phi, and the variation of vol phi. Well, by general principles, it has to be written as the wedge product of delta phi with something. What else could that something be than the star phi of phi? So, well, except for up to a factor, which I think, let's not bother look at my notes, I think it's a third, but so in fact, but it, more this has to be the formula, up to a factor. No, this is just... Algebra, this is just algebra at a point, oh. at a point. So we're just looking at, like, I'm just looking at the map from this open subset of lambda 3 to lambda 7. Yes. So this is, yeah, we've better done it point-wise, really, we're talking about here. So this is, this is algebra. Um, so now, varying in this space, 
So this is an, this is an open condition, so we can ignore that. Uh, we're varying in this cohomology class, so we look to set delta phi is equal to d of a two-form alpha. So the variation at vol is the integral one third the integral of d alpha wedge star phi of phi. Uh, on a compact manifold, so we can integrate by parts, and this is the integral of alpha wedge d star phi. So this vanishes for all alpha if and only if this thing is zero. <coughs> so this is, this is equal to zero for all alpha if and only if d star phi of phi is zero. So now, the main claim we want to make is that, in fact, um, if we have a critical point in this setting, it will always be a, a strict local maxima, modulo, modulo diffeomorphisms. Of course, <coughs> we have the, the, the space of diffeomorphisms of N, or let's say the diffeomorphisms isotopic the identity, they act on AC. So that we have a sort of a gauge group of degeneracy by that. If we divide by the, the, the by that action of the diffeomorphisms, this functional, the critical points are always strict local maxima. So that has a with, with some uh, some additional details added, uh, that has a corollary that uh, if we deform the problem, then there's a unique way to deform the critical point. We have a non-degenerate critical point. So if we had any kind of deformation, the sensible kind, we should be able to deform the critical point in a unique way. In particular, if we deform the cohomology class C, we should have a unique deformation. So near to this given solution, if we deform our cohomology class C, we'll have a unique solution for each in each case, that is to say that we have the local Torelli theorem that the map that takes the moduli space of solutions to the cohomology class is a, a local isomorphism on the moduli space, modulo diffeomorphism. <laughs> so let's, let's write all that down. So the claim is that any critical point is a strict local maxima modulo diffeomorphisms. Not, not be too formal. And the corollary <coughs> the our local Torelli theorem, I might call it. The map that takes phi to its cohomology class defines a local isomorphism of the moduli space of these, these G2 structures with H3 and H3 of MR. Well, uh, what we're going to see is actually the Hessian is a non-degenerate quadratic form. That's what we're, we're going to prove. Yeah. <clears throat> so let's put the corollary in inverted because strictly one needs some more technical details to express what you mean by this. But th those are all straightforward in our setting. <clears throat> so in particular, um, you see, we could, do, we could dimensionally reduce this in the same way we're discussing. We could, there's no reason why we don't, shouldn't take our manifold to be the product of a six-manifold with a circle. And then, simple principles, all our solutions will split off as products. And so we will deduce as a corollary of this 
the Torelli theorem for Calabi R three folds. That the varying in the H three of six manifold times S one will get a class in the H three of the six manifold, which is the, the kind of the, the, the whole morphic three form part, and a class in the H two, which is the the, the Kähler class part. But this this seven dimensional view sort of gives a maybe a simpler point of view on that. Yeah. So this is this is uh, this claim. Explaining this claim is going to be the main topic for the next next bit of time. Because this involves coming to coming to grips more with the the, the more the, the details of. Um, Geometry and, and analysis on one of these uh, special manifolds. So as I say, what we're really talking about is understanding the second variation of this functional at a critical point. So we can um, just sort of proceed to an extent in a mechanical way. If we look at the, remember we had this, the, the, the fine dimensional version was just this volume function. Uh, we need to think about the second, the second variation. I say the, the Hessian of the, this, the second derivative of this function on the vector space of the space of three forms. So to express that, we need to consider the decomposition of forms under our group G2. <coughs> so we have our um, we have naught forms. We have the one forms. They don't. They, nothing interesting happens now. This is. Uh, but when we get to the two forms, we get something interesting. As we've said several times, the Lie algebra of G2 is naturally embedded in our space of two forms. So that's uh, a 14 dimensional subspace of the two forms. And then we have a complement, which is a seven dimensional piece. And this is easy to understand. This is just the things that you get by contraction uh, with uh, the three form. And then when we go to the three forms, we have we have a, we have our given three forms. So we have a one-dimensional space, which is just the multiples of that the form we're given. We have a um, a seven-dimensional space, which is just similarly the set of contractions of the four form. Uh, and then we have the rest, which is a twenty-seven-dimensional piece. So we're, all we're doing is, in a sense, we're just decomposing these standard representations of the orthogonal group when we restrict to the subgroup G2. And this is, this is the answer. <coughs> so for the immediate purposes, what we can do is we can write uh, infinitesimal variation in phi. It can be expressed naturally as these three parts composed of these three subspaces. So this is delta 1 phi plus delta 7 phi plus delta 7 phi. And uh, what is, with that in hand, we can go back to write down a formula for just the second variation of this algebraic function, this pointwise. And it's um, a funny, no well, it sets four thirds. Each time I do it, I get a different number. So it sets four thirds times the norm of the first part plus the norm of the seven part 
minus the norm of the 27 part. All of this times ball phi. Yeah. So that's, that's uh, a sort of routine thing to do, but doesn't seem to help the proof of our claim because this doesn't have any obvious sign. You've got positive and negative terms. There's no, that's, that's the, uh, the non-trivial thing about this claim is that we don't see it just if we just naively do this. So in other words, if, if we, <coughs> the global version of the same thing is to say, if we take the second variation of our volume function at a critical point, will be the integral of the same thing, just int the same thing integrated. And the claim is that uh, for variations in a fixed cohomology class, in fact, this is always negative. So that's what we're saying. It's sort of so to understand that, we need to go on to, <coughs> well, more let's do Hodge theory. That's to say, we want to understand the relation between the is decomposition of the forms and the exterior derivative. Oh, we've we just rubbed off, it seems. Right. So this is this is just like what one does is familiar with on a Kähler manifold, where we take the PQ composition and the primitive decomposition and study how the, all the differential operators and we have identities and so forth. We can do the same thing on any manifold of, of restricted holonomy. There's a general theorem of Chern that if we dec if we have any holonomy group, we decompose the forms according to the, it's the representation theory, then that commutes with the, the Hodge theory, so that the harmonic forms actually could decompose in the same way. <coughs> so that's what we're really doing here. Or well, that's the context of what we're doing here. We, we're going to have some identities that are analogues of the Kähler identities in the familiar case between the various operators. So here we've got our one forms. We've got our two-dimensional and our 14-dimensional piece of two forms. So we've got components of D going here and here. And then we've got our three components of the three forms. So we get a wonderful collection of um, operators and possible identities <laughs> between them that we can study. And of course, we have adjoint operators, which go back in the opposite way. So the, the, um, all, what, we, what we need from that, in our case, is that uh, the component of D from the 14 piece here to the 1 piece here is 0. Um, and um, the component of D from the same thing, the 14 piece to the 7 piece, is the same as D star from omega 2, 14 to omega 1. See that these, we can identify, but as the notation suggests, this, this, these are sections of a bundle which is <laughs> isomorphic to the cotangent bundle. So we can identify these things. With these things, of course, it's a scalar choice in how we do that. With the right choice of scalar, we get this identity. So this is like a Hodge, the, like the sort of so, so the similar things you get familiar with in Kähler geometry. And this really uses the, the hypotheses. If we just had the, uh, we, we, we use the fact that we're satis we have this holonomy condition, otherwise there'd be lots of extra lower order terms that come in, just like if you try to do Hodge theory on a non kähler manifold, you get some big mess. <coughs> Sorry? Not, well, in the spirit of Chern, I mean, um, yeah, similar spirit of 
I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure actually what Chern's exact theorem <laughs> stated, but it's the same spirit of that you can. Um, yes, it's the same. I mean, the general principle is that these are first order operators, so uh, just from sort of general considerations, there's no zeroth order term that can come in. So as the, if the symbol, you only matter to compute the algebra of the symbol. Um, you don't have to worry about lower order terms. <coughs> so let's um, explain how that this this uh, lemma on the sort of helps us to prove our claim. So by, by hypothesis, we're considering a variation in this fixed cohomology class. So our, our variation can be written as d of alpha. But alpha is not unique. And there are two ways in which we could change alpha without really changing the, the geometric meaning. One is that we could, um, we could change alpha to alpha plus d of eta. Oh, well, we don't change d of alpha. So that's one thing we could do. Another is that if we're working modulo diffeomorphisms, any change we get from if taking, if we apply an infinitesimal diffeomorphism that corresponds to a vector field, that will change phi by the Lie derivative of phi under that vector field. But that does, that's not a sort of a a gene that we, we want to divide by that change in, informally. So uh, we can change. What that means is since the Lie derivative in a vector field V of phi, we have our formula that's D of the contraction plus the contraction of D. But D of phi is 0. So this is just D of IV of phi. So what that means is if we can change alpha to alpha plus D of I v of phi for any vector field v, that's not really making an essential change. It's just changing by the action of a diffeomorphism. <coughs> and so well, what are these things? These are just the things in <coughs> omega 2, 7. So we can change our alpha by any omega 2, 7 form, or we're not making it, it's no geometric difference. <coughs> so the, the consequence is that we can take alpha, uh, we can ignore the 7 part. We can take alpha to be an omega 2, 14, because the 7 part is just diffeomorphism action. But we've still, got, we've still got some residual freedom from this first part. We could change the, out the omega 2, 14 part by this component of d of something. And the, way, the standard Hodge where we normalize out that is to say we impose the condition that d star of our thing is 0. So by the standard Hodge theory, we can take d star of alpha is equal to 0 just by normalizing out this, and taking the, the orthogonal complement of the image of D in this context. <clears throat> but now, you see, now, now we're done. Because once we're in omega 2, 14, D star of it is 0, that's the same as saying the omega 3, 7 part is 0. And the omega 3, 1 part was a 0 anyway. So all we're left with is the omega 3, 27 part which has got the right sign. So that's it. That's, that's the, the, the proof. <coughs> so, for, so we um, Well, perhaps we should also say that, for simplicity, let's suppose there's no two-dimensional cohomology. Otherwise, we also want to be orthogonal to the two-dimensional harmonic forms. So that's, but so the basic, so the basic thing is that, um, so then, then under these restrictions, 
and delta squared vol is minus the norm of d27 of alpha squared equals minus the norm of d alpha squared. Okay, so that's that's an outline proof of why we get this definiteness property, even though we didn't it wasn't apparent from the sort of the formula we wrote down first of all. <coughs> and in fact, that's bound up with the nature of the equation. If we if we look at the if we just write down the linearized equation in an obvious way, the linearization of this G2 equation, it doesn't appear sort of on the face of it to have very good problem. It doesn't appear to be elliptic. Of course, we need to build in the gauge fix, anyway, but it's not obviously elliptic. Uh, but in the same spirit, um, when, you, when you have to take this point of view, you find that the linearized equation the, the linearization of our torsion-free G2 structure equation is the Laplacian from so what actually works out as being cur the kernel of D star in omega 214 mapping to itself. So this is an elliptic equation. So that's another, um, say, another good general, important general fact about these structures we're studying. These they're all given by elliptic equations. So we expect to have a, we want to have a robust theory of them. We spend, if we had a very overdetermined equation, we might think, well, we're never going to find any solutions, or only in very special situa situations. But uh, no, they have determined elliptic equations. What, um, well, as, as we'll see in examples, probably actually on Friday now, the, 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 the manifolds we're going to have, the, the examples that we're going to have, are going to have not just non zero, um, or quite large three dimensional cohomology. So we're not expecting to find just a, sort of a single unique G2 structure, but a whole big modulized space of them, They're locally modeled on the three dimensional cohomology. Um, so we have to say. So we could ask. There are different questions. We could ask. We start off with some seven manifold, and we could say, can we find a single one of these structures? Or if we found one of these structures, can we understand the whole moduli space of them? Uh, well, we can ask those questions, but basically we have no idea of <laughs> the answer. There are no real tools systematic answers to those questions. Um, because if we, we could take the corresponding discussion, say for kalabi yau manifolds, and there, of course, we do know a lot because we have Yao's theorem that says that if we're given a, a kalabi yau manifold in the complex geometry sense, a manifold with a, a trivial canonical bundle, then, and, and we're given a Kähler class, then there's a unique Calabi our metric in that cohomology class. So, um, in a sense, that reduces the question to algebraic geometry. Or many, many situations we have to. Uh, but so here we don't have algebraic geometry. But sort of we're so um, as we said, not this, not, not. Not uh, um, there, there are not m many general tools for th for doing things, and that's, that's the interest of the subject. 
Uh, so, but it's just what I want to point out. So there is some there is some theory available to to understand compactification of moduli. The, 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 the natural thing one's inclined to do, we have these great big modulized space to try to make it be easier to understand it to be compactified in some way. So there, are, there is some th general theory one can bring to bear with that using the fact that these are manifolds with zero Ricci curvature and there's a, there are general theorems of uh, Cheeger and Kolding and others that enable one to understand a certain amount about limits of uh, sequences of manifolds with zero Re Ricci curvature. Uh, so there is some theory, but um, by and large, everything one can do is uh, more a matter of conjecture and speculation than things we know. And what we're going to do next, but maybe we'll actually get to that, say, in the next lecture, is to uh, explain the basically two known constructions of these um, manifolds, one due to, to, to Joyce and the other to Kovalev. So we'll explain those briefly um, next time. But as, as you'll see, each of those, in a sense, studies small neighborhoods of infinity in our compactified moduli space. I mean, that may not, probably wasn't how Joyce and Kovalev thought of it, but in a sense, that's the way of thinking. We have some vast moduli space, possibly of a huge dimension, basically completely mysterious, but there may be some neighborhood of infinity that we can roughly speaking, at least understand. And that's about as far as the, the limits of the subject at the moment. They're trying to peer out into what happens here is, uh, I say, more conjecture and speculation. So I'm going to explain these, those observations more uh, later and review these constructions. But let's, both of these constructions will depend upon um, so essentially the point about um, Crucial in both of these constructions will be an understanding of what are called K3 surfaces. So let's spend the last few minutes of this lecture reviewing some facts about those. <coughs> so this this will be um, well, crucial so in, a, in a detailed level in the constructions we're going to describe, but also at a general level in the sense that in the case of K3 surfaces, we do understand to some extent these questions, as I'm going to recall. And obviously, one couldn't expect to know more in the seven-dimensional case than one can in, the, in this four-dimensional situation. So let's let's review a more generally hyperkähler form of So in terms of our, our list of holonomy groups, this corresponds to the subgroup SP1, or that's the same as SU2, sitting inside SO4. <coughs> But these things can also be, these structures can also be understood um, in terms of uh, d differential forms in an easy way. So let's review that. If we have a, a four dimensional manifold Q4 and we have a triple of, of two forms on our four manifold, which, uh, so they want to be closed as usual, D of omega i equal to zero. And then we want um, the algebraic condition is just that the, the wedge product is just so we have some volume form, strictly positive volume form, and these forms are all orthonormal in natural sense. So the wedge product of omega i with omega j is zero if i is not equal to j and is the volume form if, if i is equal to j. 
So it's a fact, but indeed we could have derived it also by reduction if we'd taken our story all the way down to four dimensions, that giving a triple of forms of this kind is equivalent to giving of the SP1 hypercalar structures. <coughs> so uh, you remember our formula, our basic models for our three form, was so we write down phi as um, the sum of um, minus the sum of omega i xi plus dx1 dx2 dx3. So when we, we, we introduce this just in a linear algebra context of three forms on, of, of uh, a tri triple of two forms on R4, but just the same formula applies to Q times, well, say, the three torus, say, if we want to stay in the compact world. Uh, if we take x1, x2, and x3 to be standard coordinates on our three torus, then omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 are now these triple of two forms on the Q component, this same formula defines a G2 holonomy structure on this product. So in particular, we could take, we can take Q, a K3 set. Well, actually, I've, 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 I've learned that this terminology is very confusing. What we mean by this is Q, the underlying four manifold, oriented four manifold, differential four manifold, is what's called a K3 surface. We don't mean that it comes with any complex structure or something, which is what this might imply. So I put in a cage-free surface in inverted compass. There's a particular class of four, four manifolds. Um, that's a single diffeomorphism type of these things, um, which are well known to have these hypercalar structures. And um, there is, as we said, a, in that case, a sort of a complete description of these things. So this is H2 of let me just review this. H2 of Q, I didn't write it in not a very invariant way. We take this two dimensional cohomology, real cohomology, it comes with the, uh, the form given by the cut product, or the wedge product, the Durham cohomology, and that's got signature 319. So let's just write it this way. It comes with a it comes with this graphic form. Uh, it also contains an, an integer lattice, say lambda k3, which is, uh, of course, not Z319. It's a more complicated, it's a, it's a famous k3 lattice, but we didn't go into that. Anyway, this, this thing comes with a, with a quadratic form on the real cohomology and a, an integer lattice. <coughs> so, what does that have to do with this special geometry? If we have a, a triple of forms like this, then we have omega i, the cohomology class, in H2 of Q. And we can take uh, a three-dimensional subspace, pi, okay, is just the span of, 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 the, of the omega i. So if we have a hypercalar structure, we have a three-dimensional subspace of this cohomology group. In fact, we can do that with any, any metric. We can do that because this is just the, the space uh, defined by what's called the, um, the self-dual harmonic forms, from another point of view. <coughs> so this is in H2. So we can think of this as a point in the Grassmannian of three planes 
in R319. But actually, this will have the property that it's a positive subspace with respect to this intersection form, and, uh, well, as, you, as clear from here. So we can take, we can take the, the open subset of the Grassmannian given by the positive subspaces. I call that. Yeah. <clears throat> So the basic um, local Torelli theorem for K3 surfaces, which again we could, I guess, derive from what we've done in seven dimensions if we wanted, but it's also easily directly, is that locally <coughs> this subspace gives a complete description of the space of hypercalar structures um, on our fixed manifold Q. Well, if we normalize out the volume. <coughs> so the local Torelli. So just say the the, the the modulized space of say volume one hypercalar structures is locally hold on not sure it's very good this, this subspace. So this other was taking this point in the Grassmannian gives a, a local isomorphism from a modulized space to a, a small open set in this Grassmannian. <coughs> in particular, um, this thing has got dimension 3 times 19. So which is 57. So there's a 57-dimensional modulized space of hypercalar structures on a K3 surface this point of view. <coughs> so this is, I say, this is a statement of the same nature as what we've said before. But, but here we have Yao, so we have a global <laughs> theorem. We can, we can give a complete description of the modulized space. And so let's just finish with that. I slightly rearranged what I was planning to do things. So saying this off the top of my head at this point. <coughs> um, so I just need to think. OK, so the globe. So I need to think a bit to, make, to see if I can get it roughly right. So let's let G is the, uh, the diffios of Q isotopic to identity. In particular, this group acts trivially on the, the cohomology. <coughs> so we look at um, our modulized space curly M is equal to volume one hypercalar matrix uh, modulo G. Uh, so we can map this to this uh, Grassmannian. That makes sense. And the statement is that this is a bijection to the, the this is a map, let's say this is a U in this Grassmannian. Uh, this is an isomorphism where U is an open dense subset given by removing a set of co dimension one subspace, sorry, uh, co dimension three subspaces in here. So U is the, comp if we take, this is where the integer lattice comes in. <coughs> So if we have any, let's call it, say, delta in lambda k3, in, in the integer lattice in here, uh, with d delta squared is minus 2, 
then we want to look at, say, um, W delta is the set of pi three-dimensional subspaces um, which such that which such that uh, delta is in the orthogonal complement of pi. So we have a given vector. So this all this all, this has got co-dimension three. So it's not it's sort of unlikely this is going to happen typically, but in a three-dimensional family, this will happen. So this is a co-dimension three subspace here, and U is the complement of of the union overall of the W delta. I think I got it right. Possibly right. I didn't. I was in the next lecture. Anyway, the point is that we have a complete description of this moduli space, essentially given by this period map, but there are some special things that we have to miss out. But we completely understand uh, what happens as we approach one of these walls uh, corresponding to um, the corresponding a two-sphere representing this particular class delta. So this is a, slightly over time, just sum up. This is a, a model of more or less the best we could imagine doing in our seven-dimensional case, to have a complete description of the moduli space. This is something we're going to use different aspects of in the, in the following lecture. Um, but also, I should say, this is also, even in this K3 case, there are many things that are not really completely understood. If we want to have a good compactification of this moduli space, that is not something that's really well understood, even, even now. Anyway, let's stop there. Um, we'll, we'll return to some examples of these uh, the compact situation and then finish off by talking about uh, some related questions in the final lecture on Friday. <laughs>